Hello and welcome to this presentation on social design patterns. I have to apologize first. I think uh, the brief that we initially put up was a little fuzzy and people didn't really know what to expect. We kind of solidified it a little bit more. And what we're going to talk about is social design patterns specific to Android, not just general mobile social design patterns. And especially relating to how to make the more app more popular and get more users and things like that. Um, small intro. Uh, my name is Kingsley. I'm the co-founder of a company called Petroflame. We're a self-product startup. We're trying to bring social very deep into Android. That's about all I can say about it at this point. We're at a late prototype stage. Uh, we're about four people. Uh, my prior experience is in uh, enterprise CRM as. Uh, software as a service. I work for Salesforce.com in Silicon Valley. I am a recent US return in the parlance. Don't hold that against me. Uh, and I love social and mobile technology. So even when I was working in the enterprise world, I was really doing a lot of uh, online communities and things like that and brought social media into the enterprise, uh, which is why I was such a terrible misfit there, I suppose. Uh, okay. So, to set the basics, let's just understand how apps become popular, right? How do apps grow over time organically? And the model is really simple, and just to rub it in, I'm going to play it three times. So first you have a user who tries your app. They like the app, so they come back, and they become a loyal user. The loyal user likes your app so much that they're going to invite their friends to come and try this app out. So that's the basic model. You have three stages. You can break it down into smaller segments like sign up, uh, completion of sign up, and things like that. But essentially, there are three stages. And just to set the foundation really strong, I'm going to play that again three times. Three stages trial, return, referral. Means more users for you, right? Trial. Returns and referrals. So the presentation is all going to be in three stages talking about these three steps and how you can encourage your users by means of social UI design patterns to perform these three steps. And I have to put up a disclaimer up front. I used to work in social gaming and some of these methods are honestly a little evil. So use them wisely. I mean I know that it's cool to be evil these days, but really use them wisely. So trials are the first step, and again, honestly, this is Google's problem. Google should be driving Android trials. And right now, I know we're all hurting. Who here wants to get their app in the top list? Right? And the problem is, in order to get on the top list, you need to already be on the top list, right? You're not getting any trials simply because you are not in one of the top lists. And your best bet right now is to try to be in one of the trending sections. So hopefully Google will fix this one of these days. And basically there are two ways to fix it. One is to do recommendations based on what you already enjoy. So if you already try some apps out and you seem to be enjoying them, Google could recommend more apps to you based on that. So that way you're not competing with the entire universe when you're trying to target your user who particularly cares about your little hobby, which might be hamsters or something. The other way is to try and make it based on what your friends like doing, and this is the Facebook way, right? Who loves getting their Facebook spam? Want to join me on Farmville? Nobody? Okay. So anyway, so that is the other way that apps get popular, which is you find out what your friends are using. And the main way that you find out, that you try out apps based on things other than recommendations, is to find out what your friends are using. And this we call social proof. Social proof is the idea that you will try pretty much anything if your friends are also doing it. And I know it sounds preposterous, and most users deny it. In fact, right now we're running a survey where we're asking people, how did you choose your cell phone? And one of the reasons in there is, my friends have the same cell phone. Almost nobody chooses that option. They all choose, I like the features. But when you dig down and ask them, like, how did you find out what features this phone has? Oh, my friend told me about it. Right? So we all like to deny to ourselves that we're influenced by other people. But 
simple fact of the matter is that we really want to know what other people are doing and we often try to do the same thing. How many of you have done something really stupid when you were young, like go swimming in a fast river and then you almost drowned and somebody had to rescue you and your mother came around and said, if all your friends are going to jump off a mountain, are you going to follow them? The answer is yes. Because it looks like fun if a lot of people are doing it. And Android is trying to do something about it. So if you look at the marketplace right now, it tells you 50 million people have downloaded Angry Birds. That should mean something, right? Does it mean anything to anybody? I don't think so. It, it just tells us that you know this app is popular, but you might have already tried this app and you don't like it, but every time you go in there, you still have to see it. So this model is obviously not working, and it's, possible, and it's very likely that I think Google is going down the route of social recommendations, because recently this started showing up in the Android marketplace. Anybody else notice this? Right? So Google is starting to tell me what apps my friends are using. But only if I go to that app and try to see what's on there. The obvious next step, once it gets a little more traction and people actually start doing plus ones more and ratings more, is to actually have a listing next to top three saying top friend apps or top apps my friends are using. And that's almost inevitable because the current scenario is not sustainable. So my advice to Google fixes this, and you can get a head start on this right now. Start begging for plus ones right now. Because soon, this is going to be the next ratings game, right? So one of the things that, you know, uh, if you learn network, uh, social network theory, and this can fill like a few lectures, is that it's better to own a big chunk of a small subgroup, like say college students, or medical students, or something like that, than to own a small percentage of a very big chunk of people. So if you can own 30% of a sub-market, that is much better than owning 1% of a really large, you know, 200 million people market, but they're all really widespread and dispersed. So some ways in which you can start begging, and this applies to ratings as well, just ask, you know, uh, the first time your user uses your app, after five minutes, ten minutes, and a lot of this comes from, you know, Facebook social games. After five or ten minutes, they'll ask you, hey, do you want to like us on Facebook? No pressure, right? Just, just, it would be great if you did. So, and nag. Nagging works, uh, it's not the best way to do it, don't piss your users off, but nagging is a good place to start. The next two are slightly evil. Uh, you could lock some things up that can only be unlocked by liking your app. Like I said, you know, some of these things are evil, use them judiciously. And this one is slightly less evil. Make something work better if the users like your app. So obviously, it's kind of like rewarding people for liking your app. But you can also tell them beforehand that if they like it, that it's going to work better. So the next big challenge for a lot of apps is retention. And this used to be the challenge with websites, and used to be the challenge with uh, software applications, but we're really starting to see this in mobile apps too, because people download a lot of apps. There's no barrier to entry. They just download it, and a lot of apps don't even get run once. You know, I might download two or three things, and if I, it takes too long to download, I forget about it, and it goes sits in my home screen, and then I never look at it again. So, the first rule of getting attention is make something that doesn't suck, okay? I mean, you first have to have a good product. Uh, that's the basic. So make something that users want to return to. Now there's some problems, like let's say you're making a calculator, right? A specialty calculator, like a scientific calculator. Users don't need it every day. Now, that's a bad spot to be in. I mean, and honestly, I recommend people who are trying to make apps to sell them, right? So if people pay a little money, then they will definitely try to use it. But if you're giving it away for free and hoping to convert some users, the user has to be in a context where they need to use that app and then remember to use your app. And that's really hard. So 
One of the things that a lot of apps have used very successfully is to use timelines or feeds. Does everybody understand what a timeline or a feed is? I don't have to explain that, right? Okay. So, does anybody have any guesses of why these are such good ways of retaining users? Why? Get to know what your friends are doing, okay. Okay. Something new will be always there. Something new? Something new will be there always. Okay, something new will be always. So, none of the answers are what I'm looking for. So, I'm going to give you a small clue and then I'm going to ask you again. Did, sorry? You don't have to initiate something. No, not again. Any Aerosmith fans here? Say again? Curious, curiosity? Okay. So, any more guesses? Temptation? No. <laughs> okay, I, I can see that. I, I think the core reason is actually fear. Don't want to miss the thing. Come on. Okay. So, Essentially, people are afraid that they'll miss something, and that's why timelines work really well, because people develop this obsessive behavior about checking this space, finding out what's going on, what's going on, what's going on, every two minutes, you know? How often do you guys check Facebook every day? Like, every two minutes, right? Some of you are checking right now, right? <laughs> I know. Okay, so people don't want to miss anything, so to take advantage of that, okay, this is evil terminology, okay. So, Think about the things that happen in your app that other users are doing that just can't wait, right? So there are deals, there are sales, there are specific events that if you miss, you actually lose some money or you lose the opportunity to go to a cool gig, right? So these kinds of things are definitely great places to do, to, 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 great things to introduce to timelines. Second is, think of things that are socially expected that you would react immediately. Post a baby picture. You aren't expecting oohs and ahs at that point. Puppies, right? Jokes. Uh, think of ways of increasing the, the speed of the stream a little bit without diluting, and I'll talk about you know, some of those techniques now. Uh, and find something predictable that you can give users every day. You just need to know that every day or every afternoon, there's going to be something new. They come back and nothing new happens, then they won't feel the fear that they're going to miss it, right? So again, remember that people essentially check streams because they're afraid that they will miss something. So find things that users care about missing and put those things into your stream. So when you try to do that, you run up against this big western fight between the chicken and the egg, right? So you need to have your users engaged in the app in the first place in order for them to create content that will make other users be more engaged in your app. So it's a big chicken and egg problem and it has been studied for years by business schools as well as technology companies and there are two simple rules. I boiled it all down to two simple rules. This is all data from Jacob Nielsen and interesting people like that who have gone there and done the research. And the first one is, I'll start with an example. In a given day, 26% of Facebook users like something, right? Any guesses why? Why do people like something? Because they can relate to it, okay? Any other guesses? So that the status comes on top. Just to show off, okay? Anyone else? Everyone likes liking? No, see, the answer is because it's easy. It's one click, right? If you look at, how many of you guys had a blog? I specifically say had because blogging is dead. Okay, lots of blogs. See, the price of content creation used to be you had to write a book and convince a publisher to sell it. Then you had blogging, and all you had to do was do a sign-up form, and you would set up a blog. And then a lot of people started setting up blogs, Never posting, only commenting, right? So the value of the participation has been coming down and coming down and coming down until we have the like. One click, 
and it conveys something to the world, like, you know, I like this cool thing and therefore you should friend me on Reddit or something, I don't know. And why this 26% number is so amazing is, I stole this chart from usage.com, Jacob Nielsen's website. How many people know Jacob Nielsen? Usability guru, yeah? Okay. So as you can see from this chart, Jacob Nielsen has obviously no sense of style. There are six font sizes in two charts, but more importantly, only 1% of users contribute. I mean, that's anecdotal, but you know, he's actually seen it in his research. Uh, only 1% of users contribute, and 90% of posts come from 1% of users. So reward the 1%, and very specifically, don't tell them that they're going to get rewarded, okay? So if you, if you set up something like, if you like us, we are going to send you an iPod Nano, you will get exactly the wrong kind of behavior. So always reward, reward fairly, but reward small. Don't reward something big, right? Uh, if, if you want to look at reward systems, definitely play some social games. I know it kind of sounds sucky, but they really figured out this reward system. People like shiny things, even if they're virtual. So these are the two rules, by the way, for retention. First thing is make participation really, really, really easy. If it's more than one click, you are immediately cutting out 10% of the population. I mean, 90% of your users will never participate anyways, okay? We are not going to be able to change these ratios that much, which is why this 26% number is so amazing, because this has been impossible in the history of social software before this. So, lower, lower the barriers to participation and reward the 1% of key contributors, your uh, top level contributors. And this applies like also to websites and all that. And you guys probably know Wikipedia uh, that a lot of pages, especially a lot of the curation, is done by the top 1% of Wikipedians. And rewarding can be things like, you know, organizing community events that keeps that core of people cohesive and in sync with each other, things like that. Even those are rewards. So if you're a Wikipedia contributor, you thrive on those interactions and those things. And that's not going to cost you that much money, but that's still very rewarding to the people who are at that 1% and really contributing a lot to your product success. Okay, so there are some other things you can do for retention. Uh, send reminders, obvious one, if you can. Uh, if you have a reason for telling the user to come back, then get the email, get an SMS, or just do push notifications. Like if the user installs your app today and hasn't used it by tomorrow, maybe a push notification is not such a bad idea. They might have just forgotten because your app took so long to download. By the way, I downloaded Firefox two days ago. And it's bigger than Angry Birds, it's like 31 MB. And by the time I finished downloading it, I've forgotten what I had started downloading it for, which is probably a good website which doesn't work with the inbuilt browser. So sending, it, sending people reminders is never a bad idea, just don't you know, be too appreciative about it. Create reasons for coming back, social games get this very right, your crops will be ready tomorrow, or your profile will be verified by tomorrow, or you know, find, find a reason, something that takes a day and can, you can clearly tell the user, hey, it's gonna take a day to do this, and you can come back, you'll have this cool new thing that you can use, that'd be fantastic. Incentivize repeat usage, you can do things like, if you come for three days in a row, uh, we'll increase your friend circle to five, like right now you can only <coughs> add three friends, now you can add five friends, or we'll give you a special badge, like Foursquare does, so after you do a certain number of check-ins, Foursquare automatically tells you, you're a wanderer, as if, right? Um, and if you are a utility app, and like I, this is the scientific calculator context that I was talking about before, if you are a utility app and you have specific contexts where you become useful, try to plug into those contexts. Like uh, I'll give you a good example. Uh, there are some uh, apps here which uh, there are some apps which help people who are traveling. Right? Some of my friends at iDoPhone they have this app which helps people traveling by train. Use course location. Try to figure out if the user is traveling by train or something like that. And then use that to drive some kind of notification. So quick recap. Uh, trials. Start asking for plus ones now. 
retention? Will an app that doesn't suck people want to come back to? Will it create feed or timeline, something that people don't want to miss out on? And remind users, reward repeat users. So those are the main things so far. The last one is referrals, and it's the key to virality. How do you convince your user, not only to just use your app, so you, so far, if you're successful, you are convinced users to try your app, you convince users to come back to your app often, so that they're developing a loyalty to it, and third, you want them to tell other people about your app. So, there's only one rule. Make friends easy to find. I see too many apps that tell users, share this app, and then it pulls up this big dialogue which says, you can send this by SMS, or Gmail, or this, or that. I don't have the time for that, because the process that I have to go through in order to tell a friend, I have to click share on your app, then decide how I want to tell them, then I would need to figure out which users I want to tell, right? So, simple thing. First, start by telling users which of their friends are actually using the product. If I know that these three friends are using this product, then I know, oh, that fourth guy would totally fit in with this group. So I want to tell him too. So you've just saved me a lot of work thinking about who else would find this app beneficial, right? Simply knowing who else is using this app really helps me figure out, okay, so the other person would also probably like this app. So remove, again, this ties in with the previous one where we talked about removing the bad, lowering the barriers to engagement, right? Lower the barriers for people to share, their, share your app. And these are all great examples, like help people find their friends from Facebook who are using the same app. Help people find their friends from the phone book who are using the same app. So that's pretty much the only rule. If you take away the decision for the user about who they should invite and who they should share with, then you've taken away like, the biggest barrier to share in your app. People actually want to share cool things with their friends. As we know, I mean, we see it on Facebook all the time. People post really boring stuff too. I mean, they want to share things with their friends. You have to help them, right? Okay. So some of the other things that you can do, you can offer incentives for people who are sharing. Uh, typical ways of doing it, these two again are slightly evil. Uh, block content, like there are some things that become unlocked only if you have a certain number of users. And, and try to make it so that this actually logically makes sense. Like, for example, farm will, your farm remains a small size unless you have a certain number of friends. And you can logically make the case that unless you have this many friends, you can't work a bigger farm. You're going to need those friends to come in and help you with your stuff and things like that. So if in some ways, you can make sense uh, to the user that having more users on here is going to be more useful for them. That is going to be a good motivator for the user to bring their friends in. So that's basically it. Uh, so to recap again, first trials. Uh, start asking for plus ones now. They're soon going to be very useful. Uh, retention. Lower the, lower the barriers to engagement. See if you want to use a timeline or something. But first, like make a really good product. Uh, lower the barriers to engagement. Reward the 1%. And then for referrals, make it really easy to find friends. So basically, there are only four or five things that you need to really think about. But think about them, really see how they apply to your app, because there are lots of different kinds of apps. Games are a completely different ballgame from apps, and apps that are you know, uh, check-in oriented, or app review oriented, or you know, restaurant review oriented, are completely different from the scientific calculator, or the trip calculator, or those kinds of utility apps. So, Think about how these four or five things really apply to your apps. And that's it. Questions? Hi, uh, you said you, know, you tell your friends about applications and so on. Many of the applications have advertisements in them when they are free. How many, what do you feel like, how many people delete the app when they see ads and how many people buy the app to remove the ads? How do you tackle that situation? I think it's different based on app. If you have a utility app, you have ads inside, and you have a pay version where they, if you remove the app, uh, I, I think a lot of people go for it. The conversion rate is going to be much higher than if you have a game and you have ads, and people find the ad gets in their way when they're playing and all that, they're just going to delete the app just to pay for it. So, context dependent, I think. But I've definitely seen lots of uh, utility apps which 
succeed, like the only feature that they add is the ads go away. That's the only thing you get for paying, and people seem to pay for that if they see utility value in your app. If it's entertainment value, I don't think they care that much. Uh, do you think it would be a good idea to introduce ads uh, into a utility app right from the beginning rather than the, before uh, that app getting very popular? Uh, Ads from the beginning or ads? Right from the inception itself from the app, uh, from the app store. Correct. Uh, I would say somewhere in the middle. Okay, that's my evil answer. When you start with, you should probably not have ads. But have a good strategy for capturing at least a small part of a small market. Correct. So Basically, if it's a sub-market that talks to each other a lot, like if they're going to be active in the forums or active in the reviews and talk to each other a lot, then it makes sense to not have ads. And in fact, you could just reward your early users by not having ads. You could just do that. See, if you, you, could, you could structure it almost as a reward for getting in early on your app that they won't have ads ever. And then the people who get in later, they have ads. So that could serve both your purposes. Uh, so currently the Android market does not allow something like a post upgrade. So if we have to enforce an upgrade, how would you do it? I think that's a technical question. No, in the, in the terms of user experience. Oh, okay. Um, how would the user experience, how, how would the, the app know that there is an upgrade available? I guess that's the technical part. Yeah, that's right. Idea. So you ping the server and you let them know. Um, you, I've seen apps do a few things. So one is they tell them about the new features they're missing out on, right? But if you look at it from the social perspective, you could you could do things like uh, so many users have already upgraded and are getting the benefit of these features. It's not just that these features are new and you're missing out on them, but you're missing out on these features that all these tons of other people are enjoying. I think that is a better value proposition socially than just saying there are these new features, right? So add social proof to it. Uh, so what you talked about mostly really well applies to uh, apps that uh, have some utility, but they're like whole bunch of apps out there just dedicated to just advertising or marketing or you know just managing a brand you know a Pepsi comes out uh, an app and it says that use this app and uh, it's just trying to advertise itself basically so how do you integrate the whole social marketing aspect into an app so it depends uh, why are those apps produced I think some of those apps are produced in order to get a lot of users engaged with that brand right and in some ways, those apps have an advantage because you already have a brand that people identify with and have certain values about. So really your job is to make sure that the app really fits in with the brand. And once you start with that, then give people forms where they, like for example, if it's, uh, I don't know what Pepsi, it's a pretty generic brand, right? But let's say, let's say it's like a fitness brand, it's Reebok or something like that. You know, obviously it's got to be a sports related app. Allow people to compare scores, allow people to uh, create a timeline of their physical activities. And, you know, try something innovative if the innovation is part of the brand. Or some, try something traditional if it's a traditional brand, you know. Uh, really, there you already have a population of users who care about the brand. And you, your job basically needs to be how do I... Uh, Get the user to uh, advertise my brand to some other users or to share this brand with other users. Correct. And it, it comes down to something that they can do that makes sense in that brand. Like the sports is obvious example, but even things like energy drinks, right? Uh, at that point, it's just really more of a creative thing because if your brand is, say, a movie, like let's say you're doing a Raw 1 game, right, which Indian Games did recently, uh, it, it's, it's both like, what is the brand doing for your app, and what is your app doing for the brand? And 
what your brand, what the app is doing for the brand is just one more point of engagement for the brand in a brand like Rawan. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, well, if that's all, I think we can wrap up the session and go for our break. Thanks everybody, thanks for coming.